Our scripture this morning comes from 2 Timothy 1, verses 1 through 14. Hear what God may be speaking to you today. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, recalling your tears, I long to see, to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on my, on, of my hands, for God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed, then, of the testimony about our Lord uh, or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher, and for this reason I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have been put my trust in, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold on to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Well, last week we started talking about uh, Paul and, and Timothy and the relationship they had and in these letters that we, we have in the, the New Testament of the relationship that they shared. And um, today kind of picks up uh, the beginning of that second letter. Um, I suspect when you went to school, um, you were taught how to write a letter, weren't you? Um, I don't know if children learned how to write a letter today or not. Um, I think I may have been in the last of those generations that were. Maybe they, they are. Um, but, you know, there's kind of a standard form to a letter. And, and he begins his letter with a salutation. You know, he, you know, I, Paul, an apostle, uh, writing to you. And then names Timothy, who he's writing to. And, you know, that's kind of how we begin our letters. Uh, now, maybe we write emails, uh, probably occasionally text. My son thinks when I write uh, text messages, they, they sound like emails. Um, my emails sound like letters. You know, I, I, you know I, when I started college, I had a typewriter in my room. By the time I finished college, I had a, uh, a computer that my dad had given to me, one of the early Apple computers. And, um, and so I was in that generation that, of transition. You know, we, we kind of started one place and we ended in a different one and, uh, and, and moved forward. But, but, but for Paul and for people in his day, there was a very typical way you wrote a letter. And he, he writes this letter uh, to, to Timothy in such a way. Um, after the salutation, there's uh, a prayer of thanksgiving. And he, you know, about how he's thankful for uh, Timothy and the faith that he's been handed down. And, uh, and he talks a little bit about his life, you know, and his past. That uh, your grandmother, 
Lois had such faith and your mother Eunice uh, and now it's been passed on to you and I know you still have it. Uh, I'm sure you do. You still have that faith within you. Um, you can tell there's been some distance in time. He, uh, he, he wants to assume that. He's pushing forward in that but, um, but there's, you know, there, he doesn't want to assume too much which I'm sure still lives in you. There's, there's this... Um, you know, he's leaving room for in case maybe there's been a, a time of distance. Maybe he knows a bit that there's been a little bit of distance. Um, that can happen in our lives and in our faith. I don't know if you've ever experienced it. Um, where, you know, a moment when we've come to faith and gosh, every day is just on fire as can be. And then a time where it seems to have slowed down and uh, it's not as... Uh, vital in our lives, and it doesn't seem as, as uh, uplifting as it once did. It can happen to us. It, uh, it does happen to us. And so he's writing to him. There's a context in which the letter comes, too, that is that Paul's writing to him from prison. Um, that's a little different place to write from, isn't it? Uh, I've not been in that spot, fortunately. Um, we've not you know, but, if, but if we've been in that place and we have that distance and we can't cross it easily, uh, the letter is what can do that. And he writes to him um, from the place of prison. It says that, um, that, that he is in a place of suffering, uh, suffering on behalf of uh, the faith that, that he has in Christ Jesus. And, and he doesn't wear that as a, um, a situation of woe is me. But he wears it as a place of pride, um, that, that he is following Christ, and whatever comes his way comes to him as a part of that. And so he writes from this place of suffering, and it's a place of suffering in the whole church. Um, there, there's difficulty uh, for Christians all over. Uh, it's just beginning, but it's, it's beginning to get, get hard. There have been real difficulties for those who are, uh, who are Jewish, and in the early days, many, if not, I mean early, obviously the earliest days, all the Christians were Jewish. But as the faith has grown out and spread out, is including others. But, but so the suffering of those who are Jewish in faith um, is, is shared by those who are Christian. And, um, and the persecution that, that comes their way is, is hard. Um, they're known for the way they love and care for each other. One of the things that was said about the, the early Christians is see how they not only love and care for their own, but how they care for our poorest as well. It's one of the marks of, of the Christians in that early time is that, that they had a love and care for those who were broken and most in need in their lives. He assures him that he's grounded in the faith. The faith is something that was there for you in your grandmother and in your mother and now is in you. And, um, and this time of suffering, um, he doesn't want him to interpret as shame. You know, there's time of difficulty. It's not as easy as it was at the beginning. But he doesn't want them to interpret that as shame. You shouldn't take that on as, as uh, that, that you've done something wrong. But to wear it and to wear your faith as, a, um, as something to be proud of. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's not something that should make us feel shame. And anything that we go through and struggles and difficulties should not make us feel shame. Indeed, they should draw us closer to the heart of our faith. And so he says to him, rekindle, rekindle the faith that is in you. Um, the, the word in Greek is a little hard to translate. Um, it can mean rekindle, but it can also mean reignite. Uh, there's a difference in those, isn't there? Um, to rekindle is something that is beginning to go out. To reignite is to do something for something that has gone out. Um, not sure which it is that he's encouraging for, for Timothy. 
But he's, he's writing and saying, um, the faith is not as bright within you as maybe it once was. But rekindle it and let it grow in faith. I'm sure most of you have been out to the lake at one time or another, out um, on a camping trip, and you build a, a fire. And you, you go out there, you built the fire, and you've got it going, and everything's great. And, um, you know, you needed to let it die down a little bit, and you go take care of other things. What happens to a fire um, if you just leave it? It goes out? Yeah, it, it, it will quit burning. Um, Daryl's thinking this is like the children's moment, you know, and we're going to, you know. <laughs> I, I had a member who said once to me, you know, if you, you keep asking rhetorical questions, one of these moments I'm going to stand up and answer. Uh, uh, the, um, if a fire untended will go out. We live in the era of electricity in the era of natural gas pumped into our homes. And we can have a fire like that. I mean, we got it at any moment. But just imagine 100 years ago, living in Chickasha, you didn't have that electricity. You didn't have natural gas pumped into your house. If, if you didn't tend the fire, it was going to go out. And if it went out, it was going to be work to get it going again. Um, that, that's what he's telling him. Um, there's a naturalness to the faith um, diminishing like a fire. Um, if we don't tend it, it will go out. It will lessen. Uh, we have to rekindle the flame. We have to feed it, right? It needs to, to have another log put on the fire. It needs to be stirred up so that it can uh, bring to life that vitality that it once shared the life that it gives. Um, he encourages them, don't give up. Don't let the fire go out, but flame it up. Add a little more fuel to it, or else it might. And it's going to be hard to get it going again once we let it go. His words are to uh, have them build the fire up in their lives and to not let it go. There's another equally valid principle that's at work throughout all of creation that the things that we feed will grow. The things that we starve will diminish and die, but the things that we feed will grow and they'll get stronger, um, like the, the growth of a tree. A tree, if it draws the nourishment from the soil and it gets enough rain throughout the year, will grow on a regular basis. And if you've ever cut down a tree or seen, you know the rings that are there that symbolize each of those years of growth throughout time. Um, if it continues to be fed and continues to get the water, it will grow for a long time. It'll grow and give vitality and beauty and nourishment. But if it, continue, if it lacks that, if it's not fed, or if it doesn't get water, it will diminish and it will die, just like with our faith. So he says to him, rekindle that faith and let it be something you're proud of. Let it be something that is a, an, a, an integral part of your life. Do not be ashamed of it. He calls us, uh, he says, not by our abilities or not by our works, that's what Paul uses, not by our works. We could say it by our abilities. Um, but he calls us by his will and his purpose. Uh, God didn't choose us because we have skills or gifts. God chooses us because it is his will. And he wants us to be a part of his life. And he wants to be in our lives. And he wants to share in that kind of intimacy with us. And so it's something we should claim and hold on to, be proud of, that God has claimed us and that God has built this relationship with us. Not because we're so special, because then we think it's about what we can do, but instead because of who God is. 
If we think it's because of our own skills, then what happens on the day that we fail? Uh, because we will. There are days that we're not going to be able to do it all. Um, then we realize that we've been trusting in ourselves rather than trusting in God. For it's God who is able to give us all of that life and is able to encourage us in our life and purpose. We're called by his purpose, not because of our abilities or who we are. When we're young, maybe we feel that way. I don't know. Um, I, I remember when I had, was in seminary, had a retired bishop who was teaching our Methodist um, history class. And at the end of it, after the class was over, he wanted to meet with each of the students. And, and uh, he, I, I remember he said, he said, Scott, you're a very tall, handsome young man. You'll make a fine Methodist minister. And, and, and I, you know, at the time I was, I was a tall and I was a young, handsome man. If those are the qualifiers for ministry, um, though, we're, I mean, I think we're in trouble because um, I'm not as tall as I used to be. I, I, I hate that. I go to the doctor, and I, you know, used to be 6'2", now I'm 6'1 and a half. I'm not as tall as I used to be. Um, I'm certainly not as handsome. I'm no longer young. Uh, that just seems to be turning, you know, day by day. Uh, you know, am I less qualified to be a pastor now than those things? I still am a man, although if you measured my T, I guess maybe uh, it's not as high as it used to be, if that's the sign of manliness in that case. Uh, if we think that the qualifications are because of our outward, who we are, those things are transitory. They leave us. Um, but we're called according to his will and are called according to his purpose. Uh, one of the things, I, I don't know, maybe you don't even want to know this, but I just will share with you. Uh, pastors, when we talk, you know, get together, I have a friend who's a Disciples of Christ pastor, and he was serving a church, and at the time, he'd, he'd turned 55, and, and um, he said, you know, I have to be careful uh, because I'm at that age now where no one's going to want me. And if I get crosswise with the church I'm serving, then I may not be able to have a church after that because everybody wants a young pastor with a family to come, right? And, and I might not have a place to go. And he said, you, you all are lucky in the Methodist system because you're sent and, you know, they try to match up the gifts and needs. And even there, it doesn't feel as safe as it used to. When I was 35, it felt really safe, you know. Uh, but it, it's different, it, you know. Those things are just, they're not what, they're not what decide uh, who we are or our calling. Our calling is in Christ. Your calling is in Christ. Our church, our calling is in Christ. And it's not by anything outward or measurable. It's because God has chosen us for his purpose. And we are here for his purpose. Not by our ability, but because he loves us. That's pretty simple. He loves us. It's like the most simple thing in the world. Not because we earned his love, just because it's who he is. So he says, you've got this incredible gift and you've got it there. It's time to rekindle it, don't let it go out. It's time to strengthen it. It's time to put another log on the fire so that it continues to burn. Because if you walk away, it might go out and you might not ever be able to get it relit. Guard the good treasure that's been entrusted to you. The treasure of his gospel in Jesus Christ. Amen.